Hi, welcome to part three of the pharmacokinetics saga, where we're going to look at remedy distribution. Um, if I can just get that to move on, yeah, well, so um, yeah, we've got the uh, remedy absorbed into the bloodstream, but um, we're not home and dry yet, unless, of course, we're treating the the, the blood vessels and heart, in which, uh, well, the blood vessel in particular, in which case we are home and dry. But um, getting the remedy to the target tissues depends on um, at least three things: regional blood flow in the area of the target tissue. Uh, ease, ease of passage across cell membranes and uh, tissue membranes and the extent of binding to proteins I uh, note the deliberate mistake in the spelling so once you've got therapeutic agent in the systemic bloodstream um, the exposure of a target tissue to that therapeutic agent will be proportional to that tissue's degree of vascularization. In other words, the more a tissue is perfused with blood, the more the remedy will reach it. The most vascular tissues are the endocrine and exocrine glands, so for example, the adrenal glands and the pancreas, the heart, lungs, brain, liver and kidneys. So a significant amount of blood supply goes to these areas. Moderately vascular tissues include skin, muscle and fatty tissue and the least vascular, the tissues with the least blood supply per cubic centimetre as it were, are bones, teeth, ligaments and tendons. Compare this to traditional humoral physiology um, where um, there was a perception of the tissues in the, of the body as having an inherent temperament which might be hot or cold, moist or dry. So here are the ten hottest uh, tissues according to this um, um, uh, way of doing physiology. You see that blood, liver and muscles are way up there. Um, the coldest tend to be the hair, bones and cartilage. Um, the most moist tissues are blood again, and fats, brain. Um, it's kind of sort of tying in a bit. Um, and the driest are hair, bone and cartilage again. So by this traditional physiology we can sort of see that vascularity correlates with the relative heat and moisture. So, which would figure because blood is considered a, a hot, moist uh, substance, and a hot, moist uh, humour for that matter. So, um, a remedy distribution to particular tissue will also depend on changes in blood flow. So, there's the in inherent vascularity of a tissue, but then that's the, the given blood flow can change and it can change quite dramatically in situations like inflammation or hypertrophy. Um, blood flow can be decreased where there is atrophy, where the tissue is de degrading, or where the tissue is hardening in fibrosis, maybe as a result of uh, chronic inflammation. Um, Blood flow throughout the body can be um, disturbingly influenced by uh, um, by diseases of the, of the major organs, like so heart disease, liver disease, and kidney disease. So heart disease will obviously um, mean that the the blood's just not being distributed properly. Liver disease, uh, there may be pulling of blood in the liver, or um, the um, the liver isn't imparting as much warmth to the blood um, and uh, kidney disease can also um, cause uh, body-wide changes in, in blood flow so maybe sort of a higher blood volume or or, um, or something like that due to 
a retention of, uh, of sodium. Obesity will also affect remedy distribution. Um, excess fatty issue, tissue will preferentially store lipid soluble therapeutic agents um, and therefore agents that are less bioavailable it will mean those agents are less bioavailable to the other tissues. So it could slow down remedy distribution. Somebody with uh, excessive fat might need a higher dose of your remedy in order to reach the target organs. But uh, the, the caution is that although more may be stored in the, in the lipid soluble uh, tissues, um, it doesn't mean to say that, that um, you haven't got the same amount uh, trying to be um, expelled by by the liver, so that you know, the, the, you know if you've got uh, a toxic remedy or a slightly toxic remedy that, that will cause issues with clearance by the liver, then you know upping upping the dose just because somebody's bigger isn't necessarily going to be the best idea. Um, Remedy distribution will depend on the membrane barriers um, between the capillaries and the tissues. Um, so uh, if you imagine a remedy in the bloodstream, it's got to cross the capillary membrane. So it's got to get through the capillary cells and then or through the gaps between the capillary cells and then it's got to cross the cell membranes into the tissue cells. So most tissues, the uh, permeability to remedies is similar to the, the membrane of the gut. Um, so when it comes to uh, breastfeeding, we, uh, to be on the safe side, we have to assume that remedies that are absorbed by the mother's guts will cross into breast milk because the the uh, mechanisms are essentially the same. When it comes to the placental barrier. Um, the placenta doesn't offer any real barrier to passive absorption, but some large ionized substances are blocked. Uh, however, to be on the safe side, we assume that remedies that are absorbed by the mother can cross the placenta to the fetus. So as a um, note of caution, that's what you would assume. The blood-brain barrier is quite different. Um, instead of the capillary cells being quite loosely associated, so there's fairly big gaps between them, and remember that the capillaries have a cell wall that's one cell thick, so if there's any gaps between the cells, and uh, smaller material can get out through those gaps. When it comes to the capillaries in the brain, those cells are tightly um, jammed together and held together. So there's a tight junction uh, with the capillary cells. And then the, the glial cells in the brain tissue also form tight junctions between each other. So then there's like a double uh, barrier. Um, so that barrier will be much less permeable to polar molecules and other tissue interfaces because the polar molecules can't just sort of squeeze in between the cells. They've got to find a way through the membranes and if you remember a polar molecule can't cross the membrane because of the lipid so it has to have carrier proteins to carry it across and indeed there is active transport of selected agents across the, um, the blood-brain barrier so um, endogenous substances that would be uh, preferentially transported would be hormones, neurotransmitters, prostaglandins um, for a bit more on um, these issues of pharmacokinetics, you can have a look at um, this ebook by uh, edited by Aldred, uh, Pharmacology: A Handbook for Complementary Healthcare Professionals, and that's available from the College Library. Protein binding will also have an effect on remedy distribution. Uh, the blood carries uh, plasma proteins, especially albumin. And you may be aware from um, anatomy and physiology, or even pathophysiology, that the 
uh, plasma proteins are quite important in, in having an osmotic uh, uh, you know, imparting an osmotic potential to the bloodstream or uh, sometimes called oncotic pressure but the the other main f uh, function is the form albumin albumin as an example is that they are carrier molecules and one albumin molecule can carry several different um, uh, molecules of, of substances that need to be uh, albumin bound to sort of go through the, the bloodstream and it might carry disparate molecules of different kinds of chemical. This uh, binding of the albumin to the compound in question is reversible um, and what we find in practice is, is an equilibrium between the free and bound compound. So if there's a lot of free compound in, in the bloodstream then as long as the albumin hasn't become saturated with bound molecules the albumin will take up more of, of that compound and likewise when the albumin reach, albumin through the bloodstream reaches target tissues uh, if there's a dearth of that compound in the tar target tissue then the albumin will be encouraged to give up the compound the compound will be, become free and it will become absorbed into the target tissue so that degree of protein binding will depend on the association constant, which is the degree of affinity between the compound and the carrier protein. So this is a little bit similar to you know, affinity issues with, uh, between enzyme and substrate. Um, it will also depend on the, the concentration of proteins, so the concentration of albumin, for example, and this is an issue with um, uh, liver failure, that the liver um, fails to make enough albumin and it's it's harder for the, the, the body to transport certain chemicals around itself, around the bloodstream. It will depend on the number of binding sites available. So you might have plenty of albumin in your bloodstream but it might be clogged up with uh, other drugs, um, uh, other endogenous compounds so that there's not enough binding sites available to carry your um, whatever it is, uh, cardiac glycoside to, um, to the heart muscle. Um, and also the degree of binding will depend on the concentration of the substrate compound. So um, if there's only a small amount of substrate there then um, but it'll bind at a certain rate, so if you increase the concentration maybe the binding will be faster, but, but when the concentration gets up to a certain level then the rate of binding will, will uh, start to uh, level off and, and there'll be a limit to how much uh, increase of concentration of the compound can actually influence uh, how much is bound. So that would be an example where if you if you were to saturate an albumin with with various substances and that albumin was crucial for carrying say uh, I don't know thyroxine around the body or something like that then you might find that more thyroxine is released and free and then uh, is able to uh, activate the tissues and then you start to get more free thyroxine rather than bound uh, thyroxine which could cause cause a problem when the compound is released from the albumin, it traverses its membrane barriers to tissues more easily than in its protein-bound form because albumin is really quite a big molecule, so it's not going to just go charging through the, the, uh, the membrane barrier. Um, and the, the, that protein binding will effectively regulate the, the availability to tissues, so it's kind of like a micro bioavailability. Um, so uh, so that's the, the last slide, but just to say about that um, area, um, an example of that, not necessarily with, well I suppose with, with drugs, um, it's, it's becoming increasingly obvious that a lot of um, pathology uh, around say uh, prostate cancers to do with levels of sex hormone binding globulin and the, ex and the extent to which uh, uh, um, androsterones are um, bound to that 
uh, molecule or are they free? So you can you can 